So once again, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's webinar brought to you by the Alberta Canola Producers Commission. Today we have online Merle Good, Provincial Tax Specialist with Alberta Agriculture, as well as Mark Muchka, a Business Development Specialist with Alberta Agriculture. And today's topic is Farm Succession Planning, Simplifying a Complex Puzzle. I'm now going to turn it over to Merle, who's going to conduct today's presentation. Okay, thanks, uh, Rick. And I'll try to get here and, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, I got to close this off and then show your screen. Uh, I think everyone can see that now. Uh, good morning. Uh, it's like I mentioned, I'd like to thank everyone for coming on the, uh, s the webinar. And uh, family business succession, of course, the farm succession is a very pertinent issue uh, in agriculture at the present time. Um, the demographics are, as we're all getting older, a lot of the businesses have to uh, look at transitioning down to the next generation. And uh, this is a very complex uh, problem, but I do think we have some uh, options here that wish that you could look at and uh, hopefully we'll start you on this road of transferring the, the farm business. So we'll start off with, um, I think, a couple of points that I'll say. Excuse me, Merle. And yes. Uh, we're not seeing your screen at this time, Merle. Okay. Well, um, sorry about that. Well, I'll try to get that uh, changed. I, I can see it. <laughs> but uh, so, some of the things I want to, to look at is a couple of uh, points when it comes to looking at succession is uh, some technologically, um, or not technology, but some issues there regarding a couple of concepts. And if you can see the screen now, I've got uh, up there now is there's uh, three things. There's uh, equity freezes, return on capital, and capital redemption. Is, that up? is it up there now, Rick? Can you actually see it, Rick, now? I can, Merle. Hello. Okay. Merle? Yeah, Sorry we're good. About, hey, sorry about these, uh, this uh, mix-up this morning. On these concepts, I, I want to get around a couple of points I think is really, really important to uh, uh, look when you do the succession planning, and that is an equity freeze, return on capital, and capital redemption. What those are, an equity freeze is where we look at uh, business and uh, decide whether or not the equity that the parents have uh, accumulated during their lifetime, we freeze that equity and then transfer the continuing equity on to the next generation. Usually, usually this is done in a corporation. I know some of you are incorporated, but some are not. In the incorporated uh, area, we do this equity freeze by reforming uh, the company, issuing new preferred shares, and giving the common shares to the children, whoever's uh, actively involved with you in the business. In a partnership, we do the same thing with a partnership interest. A lot of accountants are not aware of this provision, but you can issue equity uh, froze partnership interest, uh, interests and have the uh, growth interest go to the next generation. In a sole proprietorship, usually this is done through the uh, sale uh, of property or land. For example, if I sell a quarter section to my son, of course, all future growth carries on to my son. So this concept of equity freeze is very, very important. And I want to talk about that in a little more detail as we go along. But uh, of course, as you all know, we farm uh, not for cash flow, but rather for equity, it seems like. So these concepts of equity freezes, I do want to revisit as we go through the talk today. The next one is return on capital. And I think that is something that I'm going to stress quite a bit on. And that is, I want to separate, and I'll show this a little later on, but we have to look at whether or not our farm is composed of really three profit centers. And so when we talk about succession planning, I really want to dis disengage the conversation to say the family farm transfer. I'd rather look at it as the business of farming on one side, and then your actually personal net worth or assets is your land. And of course, as you all know, most of you gentlemen and ladies do have some rented uh, land in your operations, and so you don't have to own land to farm. Of course, it's nice, but the same token is we have to look at whether or not we want return on capital on various profit centers. So, for example, in a corporation situation, usually I like to have the land rented to the company so the parents as land owners get, can get a return on their capital and so the family farm actually pays them for renting their property. And we can do this uh, regardless whether it's a company, partnership, or even a sole proprietorship if we set it up properly. 
The last one point is a thing called capital redemption. And this one here, I think, is really, really important as well. It kind of goes together with the equity freeze. And that is, over time, how can we redeem our equity in the business uh, as parents so that our children, our actively farming uh, child, can actually show that equity uh, increasing on their balance sheets? So we'll go through this a little bit more. But I want to get those three technical concepts out. And uh, so I know they're kind of complicated, but I'll show you in a few minutes how they actually work. Okay. Mm, if the thing would move down, it'd be great. Uh, excuse me. This is not working good, lad. Technical errors this morning. Okay, discussion points. I uh, really want to look at, again, the focus on the viability and expansion of our businesses. The previous two seminars, we did talk quite a bit about the uh, aspect of financial viability. And, of course, in any intergenerational business transfer or when a child comes back to farm, this viability and income, of course, is a huge issue. It's going to be more complicated all the time. I always joke in my seminars that 25 years ago when I did this work, uh, parents would retire on $1,000 plus Canada Pension and OAS. Uh, that isn't happening now, and so the living requirements on both generations are quite uh, a challenge on our traditional family farms. and That's something that we have to really look at, and uh, we'll talk about that more another day as we do some of these seminars with uh, Rick down the future. But I think that one we have to really look at. And I'd like to challenge the conventional thinking. And that is, once uh, one of your children wants to come into the business with you, I really, really stress this, and I want you to really consider this, have them do the business plan, not you as the older generation. Let's set some parameters of what you need out of the business, but then let the second generation focus on how and do a business plan on how they're going to work this business with you. If you don't let them do that critical step of creating their own plan, they're going to continue to simply work under your plan. So I, I, I want to change that focus and change that responsibility. Uh, we talked about parents retiring more on return of equity. I'll put that into an uh, example for you. I think that maybe helps the best. Let's assume that, uh, I'll give you a case of a farm that I worked with a few years ago, and there was two brothers and the father, and dad was taking out $60,000 a year. And is that a high number? Well, it's really irrelevant until we look at the viability of the operation. But what was unique, I wanted to see in their operation of why the business would be paying, paying anyone a return on their either labor, management, or equity. And in this case, Dad had retired. He was fairly old. And uh, so I asked him, how much does he do in management? None. Marketing? None. Uh, drives a tractor a little bit. And so I said, well, if I was, if you were working for me in my business, what I would pay you, and uh, I asked him whether it be, uh, what's a good hired man worth, and so he soon got to the point where I was getting at. Even though he was an owner of the business, why was the business paying him? For what work? And so his labor was one component of the cost, but the main thing as well was that he owned shares in the company, and in a, in a sense of that $60,000, some of that should have been redemption of preferred shares. In other words, he should have been living off his equity and not simply getting a $60,000 salary for labor when the labor wasn't being done. So I'll carry on a little bit more on that in a few moments. So I'm going to uh, look at this in a little more concept now, and that is separating land from the business operations. In my view, land is a personal wealth asset, and access to the land is more important than ownership. And also, transfer of land should be viewed as uh, a transfer to a business partner and not to a family child. What I mean by that is, I think I want to uh, use different terminology when we talked about uh, the family farm transfers. When a child becomes and decides to become a member of the business, I'd rather we use the words that he has become or she has become your business partner. I don't want to use the words family, uh, farming child versus non-farming child. In my view, a child is a child. 
but we need to separate their careers. One has chosen to be a member of the business, one has chosen to do his own thing somewhere else off the farm. If we make that distinction, I think it helps us look at this issue of fairness and equity, because what we're really saying to us is how much of this business do we want to transfer to, of our equity in the business to the partner versus how much of our equity do we want to transfer to a non-partner. I know it's just a play on words, but it's an important play, I think, as we go along. So here I want to go back over these uh, income issues one more time. I think I'm going to skip ahead just a second. I'm going to go to this slide right now. I think that will help us out a lot in, in our discussions. What I, what I have here is a little puzzle, I call it, which I think helps us explain what I believe is some of the issues we need to look at. On the left-hand side, or in my screen, your farm business, that's your operating assets. Of course, that's your cattle, equipment, inventory, operating debt. And out of there, you've got to pay salaries, dividends, etc. And on the other side, we have the land and your off-farm investments, assets. You notice all three arrows are connected, all three circles are connected by arrows, and there's a reason for that. So let's discuss this for a second. If you would take, normally when you talk to your accountants and lawyers, they lump this all together. I think that's why it is so difficult to solve this puzzle. If we would separate these pieces into these three uh, separate entities, I think you'll find it is a lot easier. So on the operating assets, that's the business. And so to me, if you sit down, and my challenge to farmers in Alberta right now is if you are looking at intergenerational transfers or you already have an intergenerational business, let's focus on that business. Is it capitalized correctly? Is there enough uh, sufficient income to go around the uh, family tables? But more importantly is let's focus on that business and put our energy and effort to try to make it more profitable. And so in the area of succession, what I would like to see is make this kind of a, of a commitment to the next generation. If you want to enter my business and to make it our business, the focus of that business is to become the most profitable business we can make it. And when it comes time to do my estate planning, and you notice I, were, I use the word estate planning, not succession planning. Estate planning to me is a transfer of personal wealth where succession planning is a transfer of the business. There's a quite a difference. So succession planning, once again, is a transfer of the business, where estate planning is a transfer of your personal assets. So in my view, if you look at this diagram again, when children come home to farm with you, I suggest, and I think it's something that you should talk with, to be with your children in quite detail when, when, they, when they become your partner, is that the equity that remains in the farm business upon death of mom and dad does not transfer back to the personal wealth side. It actually stays on the farm business side. And then, in my view, that equity that is left at the end of your careers should be left to your business partner. And therefore, I don't think in agriculture we can afford to pay off uh, any kind of debt on the farm business to off-farm children. So once again, what I'm trying, trying to say is the business is the business and the personal wealth is another issue. Now on the other side, which is your estate planning, excuse me, <laughs> on the other side is your estate planning and what to do with the land. <clears throat> the capital gains exemption and the rollover rules are very favorable for farm property as we all know. So that land can be left tax-free to anyone in Canada at the time of your death. It also can be transferred during your lifetime with little or no tax, depending on your situation. So in my view, the land is going to be either left to part of it to the business, i.e. crosses the line back into the business, or can actually transfer down to your off-farm asset bubble, which I'm going to say can be left to non-business partners. So with that, once we make that determination, I think it becomes quite easy to look at our wills and our succession plans. In Alberta, I have come across very few family farm situations where some land is not going to be left to a non-farming, well, sorry, some land will be left to a non-farming child. And uh, with that, I think we have to come up with methodologies and ways that the operating business can have access to that land 
not necessarily owning all of the land. And uh, one of the things I've come up with uh, with our consultants we use in tax and, and lawyers is a thing called a, uh, a long-term lease and also a conditional bequest. So during your lifetime, I would like to see the land leased to the business and whether that's leased to the company or leased to the partnership. So in other words, we're setting up a long-term lease from uh, you as the owner of the land to your business. It's a formal lease and uh, it's set up so that if something did happen uh, where that dad and mom say were killed in a car accident and some of their land went down to their daughter, the business would still have access to that land maybe over a 10 year lease period. What this does of course is gives the business a chance to uh, restructure their operating and have access to the land and eventually if they can even purchase that land. So in a sense we could have it in our, in our uh, wills that that quarter section that went down to the daughter is hers on the condition that the lease is honored and that the uh, farming business has a right of first refusal to buy that land if ever sold. So in a sense we can set it up so that uh, two things happen. The farm business gets a chance to rent the property but also has, a proper, has the ability if it can't afford to to actually acquire that land perhaps on a discount value. Uh, farm families that I've worked with, sometimes that number is 75% of appraised value. So in other words, if the land is left to the daughter and she decides to sell it in five or six years, then the business can actually acquire that land if it meets anyone else's offer and the trigger price is 75% of that offer. That is in order to allow the business to actually have the ability to purchase that land and not have to put on other uh, assets for security. So that's just a concept I'm trying to get across, I guess, is that, is that we need to separate these two bubbles around to get a handle on trying to solve the estate versus succession. On the off-farm assets, the last one at the very bottom, this one, uh, when I first started, of course, insurance was used as the equalizer. Uh, we leave the land to the business and leave the insurance and investments to the off-farm children. With the exploding value in farm uh, real estate, of course, this uh, traditional methodology does not work. I use this example in my courses at Balzac, where a uh, family I worked with uh, 10 years ago, each quarter section was worth $5 million. So it's pretty tough to be able to say, uh, my uh, farming son gets four quarters worth $20 million, and my daughter's get my $200,000 life insurance policy. So I use that as an extreme example, but it does show you how that the traditional let's buy life insurance and treat everybody uh, equally on asset values simply does not work anymore in most of Alberta, in fact all of it. And secondly, what these arrows are connected to, what really concerns me is where the business is drained of some of its profit. So in other words, if we take profit out of the operating assets of the farm business and push it into your off-farm investments for the purposes of estate planning, I think you'll drain your business to the point that maybe it isn't viable. And so that is why I think I want to look more and more at is if we're going to give asset values on the estate planning side away, we have to probably look at some land being transferred to the, to the other off-farm children rather than trying to fund it through uh, uh, insurance products or especially after tax RRSP. Uh, on your death, of course, you pay roughly 40% of your RRSP in tax when it is liquidated. So that's a long-winded, uh, usually about a half an hour talk in about six minutes, but I do want it to uh, give an idea of these three bubbles first. And then I'm going to go back up. I'm going to jump in here for a second, Merle. We yeah, did a quick poll. You couldn't see us doing it, but 83% of the people on, uh, on this call have one or more children uh, with them on the farm. Um, so this, this puzzle that Merle's talking about, this slide here, really fits to that. Uh, for the 17% of you, uh, Merle, maybe just give them a quick comment if, if it makes, uh, if it's as necessary to separate the land out of the equation from the operating assets. Okay. If, of course, you have uh, no one who's going to take over the operation, then, of course, there's not near the uh, uh, requirement to do this kind of separation, as Mark just talked about. The only thing I would say on that, though, is that in certain situations, you still may want to have your land, especially in companies, if those who are incorporated. I don't like land in companies uh, very often, 
And so if you are not, if you have your land not in the company yet, I would strongly advise you not to do that because if you ever decide to exit the farming business, uh, you know, rent your land out or, and sell the cattle and equipment, you don't want your land in a company because you, you'll pay tax and you can't use your capital gains exemption on a sale of land and sign a corporation. So maybe that'll help on that question, Mark. But going up a little bit, I want to go back up and these, I, should, I, I want to go back to this uh, cash out of your business. So I want to focus for the last seven or eight minutes on the actual operating bubble of the uh, business. And here is really, really want to get into. If everyone would do this at the end of each year, I think you'll find out that uh, people will understand what is their objectives and what is their requirements of income from a business. And that is any business, partnership or company, I'll use either one, or proprietorship, you really should be being tracking what you're getting paid for. And there's a consultant down in Iowa, or in, uh, in, in uh, yeah, just south of uh, in Iowa there, it was up at Farm Tech years ago, and he really stressed this, and I have to admit, it's when I heard him speak, it's very, very important to understand what he was trying to say. When you get a check out of your company or partnership, is it for your labor? Is it for your management? Is it for redemption of your capital, which I talked about? Is it for renting the land from your uh, landowners? And the last one is shareholders' loans and a company. The reason why this is so important, I kind of alluded to that example earlier about the uh, farmer up north, is what allows the younger generation to see is where the farm is slowly starting. Mom and dad are living, except, and the way I'm trying to say is the farmer is living off his equity and allowing the child to earn that equity. So I'll give you an example. If you have a farm that has equipment inventory of worth 1.5 million, and let's assume that the company was created and dad and mom took back a million and a million and a half of preferred shares and son got the common shares. If we did that today, what do you think that company is worth 10 years from now if mom and dad don't re redeem any of their corporate capital? Even if it goes up by 500,000, in a sense, the son may only receive half of the growth in the common shares, so he's worked for 15 years and only getting a return of, of very little. On the other side, the land, of course, is the parents, and of course it keeps going up, and so in a sense, that's, that's their equity gain on the land. So I'd rather see us look at, and I challenge the accountants as well on this, is when you take dividends out of a company, I don't want a return on corporate capital as much as a capital redemption. This is a very technical point, but what I want you guys to understand in the conceptual uh, aspect is I want dad and mom to slowly start redeeming their capital out of the company or out of their partnership. The reason why is my goal, as far as I'm concerned, looking at the kitchen table, is to say to the parents, wouldn't it be great that by the time you leave this earth that the operating business belongs to the next generation? Because if you don't, what happens is this. The uh, dad on his deathbed says, you know, I gave the company to my child. And the company and this child who talks to Mark and I says, you know, I've worked there for 30 years and I paid dad this money. I paid him this 60000 a year. The accountant called it all labor. So in other words, he died with $1.5 million of preferred shares. And of course, if you die with that much equity, then you have this problem of should I be giving some of that equity away to my estate planning side. And so I really, really struggle with that. And I do believe that when you look at enticing the next generation to become your business partners, I would really like to see as a focus is that really <laughs> at the end of your farming career time, you live off your equity. And over time then the business will transfer simply by that methodology to your uh, child or daughter over their career. So at the end, I think my objective would be at the end of your active farming career, you simply live on redemption of equity and your, fa and your son, of course, will then have that increase in equity on his side. Remember, you still have tons of equity on your land side, which you have to deal with as your estate planning. So I think that's important. I don't, I, I don't think there's enough income in farming not to get excited and we'll all, we all like to have equity and see our, our, our balance sheets go forward. I think that's one way of actually enticing the uh, second generation to remain on the farm as you can transfer that corporate or partnership equity over 
and yet uh, and, uh, separate those two uh, issues of uh, business capital versus uh, land capital. So I think um, the only thing else I have on to look at yet, here's an example of one just uh, showing that uh, if this parent did receive $60,000, maybe they do $10,000 of management, $10,000 of labor, they lease their land uh, to the company for $20,000 cash rent, and here's where I want the $60,000, or sorry, $20,000 of capital redemption of preferred shares, so the total income received is 60. And uh, on this one, you notice I have said in the bottom, uh, parents have said not, not to charge a return on capital. In other words, we're not charging uh, any kind of value on our preferred shares. And so the dividend is not a return like you do in the uh, stock market. The dividend is really a redemption of preferred shares, which is a redemption of equity. So instead of having dad simply get a $60,000 salary, correct, which normally these, these accountants do, I'd rather see, uh, we look down and look at this to say, hold it, this is how we want it paid out. So we all understand why father and mom are getting this kind of money. The same thing should happen on the son's side. And I, do, I do have another overhead. I usually use sort of the same example on the son's side. So for example, if the son wanted 60 grand, he doesn't own land. Say it's just a guy at 23 years old coming back from Olds College. He doesn't own any land. He has no preferred shares. Where's his 60,000 going to come from? Well, maybe management 20 and labor 40. So what that shows is that the son has to do four times as much work as dad does. And that does, even though it sounds humorous, it does set the tone of who should be out there calving the cows at 2 o'clock in the morning because that's why he's getting paid 60. Dad, and effectively, could actually never walk out the door and get 60 grand if he wanted to redeem his equity. So, Rick, I think that gets us to 9.30. I'd like to open it up for questions. Um, and, uh, and Mark and I can uh, try to answer those. And uh, we're here for as long as the people want to stay on the line. There's no requirement to end at 9.30. If they want to stay on, we'll keep on talking. Okay, Merle. Our first question comes from Sean. And uh, it's fairly long, so bear with me. And it's two parts. I have no children that are going to take over the farm. This is a corporate farm. My wife and I have common shares, as well as a family trust that has common shares. Should we be able, should we be looking at a conversion to common shares to take advantage of capital gain exemptions? I have used some of my exemptions, but my wife has not, nor any of the kids who are beneficiaries of the family trust. Oh, that's an, is, that's an easy one. <laughs> Uh, it's a very complicated question, and without knowing all the facts, but if no one's coming over the farm and it's all corporately owned and you had a family trust, probably the reason why you have the family trust on some of the corporate shares was a thing to call dividend sprinkling. You, you would have paid dividends down to the family trust, and that trust could have then dividended the uh, income out to the various beneficiaries of the trust. So those are usually set up for an income uh, reason, not necessarily for a capital reason. So in that view, I think that's what's happened is you've set up a family trust for income splitting purposes of the dividends. Now, when you go to sell that property, if none of your children want to take over the farm, uh, when you say no one wants to take over the farm, this is where I think you have to challenge that question. Maybe they don't want to actively farm the assets, but maybe they want to own the farm and lease them out. And I think that's the question we have to look at. So in your situation, you can roll over all the shares and you can have the equity of your company, if it does own the land, transfer the next generation. They can sell the equipment, sell the inventory, pay your tax, and then turn around and lease that land out to other farmers. And I think that's something a lot of uh, uh, families who don't have intergenerational active farmers, they do have children who will actually own their equity. That's some discussion I think you should have with your, with your kids. Because right now, if you can get you can get about three percent, and Mark has done some work on this, about a three percent return on your fair market value of your land, plus your your children can actually get the capital gains exemption themselves. So owning land in the province of Alberta and leasing it out has been probably a lot more safer and a lot more uh, advantageous investment than the stock market has been. So I think sometimes we need to talk about if you want to, if you have three or four children, they're going to own land. How can they look at this as a long-term investment rather than just selling it? Your comment about common shares, 
if you try to sell the common shares intergenerationally, I'm sorry, inter intercorporately between your trust, there's a complex situation there, and you can use your exemption, but it doesn't do you much good. Uh, I'd have this gentleman, if you want, Rick, to give me a call at, at the office, because it's a very complicated question, and I can try to answer that at the office, and my phone number is 556-4237. Okay, next question comes from KP. Merle, can you advise how a producer can try to bring a business partner child back to the farm and show them the positive side of farm living? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, one, you know what's interesting, uh, ladies and gentlemen? One of the biggest things I've seen lately, and of Mark maybe not as well, is that when we talk to people who have decided to make farming a career, they know they're going to give up some purchasing power on personal wealth as far as living. But you know something? The advantage of staying home and not having to go in the oil patch and be gone from the family for six months out of 12 does have a lot of merit. And I do think it's important to look at when people talk about coming, comparing working off the farm, working on the farm, the farm has a lot of benefits that are hidden benefits in your employment package. Like for us who work off and have a job, of course you've got to pay tax rates, there's no deductions for living. We're in a family farm, any business, you can deduct certain personal expenditures on an on a, on a, on a after-tax basis. So even though you might only get $2,000 a month from the farm as actual cash, when you look at all the other benefits that could be provided by the business, you may be getting close to $3,000 a month or $3,500. So I think that's important to look at the cash flow first of all like that. That goes back to my question is if you can focus on the business, and I guess I'll be quite blunt. I told this people in, in farm tech, if I'm coming back to the business, I want a guarantee that whatever we grow this business to on the operating side of my puzzle belongs to me. I am not going to share it with my brothers and sisters when you and mom pass on. So if I'm coming home to work, I want that guarantee that if I put my effort into the operating side of our business, that it belongs to me, even though you and mom have equity upon your death. Otherwise, why come home? Because you cannot sacrifice your income level and have to pay for the uh, uh, fair market value equity that remains in the uh, business side. Seeing as though you answer. mentioned death, we'll go to KP's next question, which was, at the Red Deer CAFA meeting, you touched on the life insurance policy for the off-farm kids and how the mm -hmm. corporation pays for the premium. Can you talk about okay. this? Oh, well, sure. I mean, I, I do like life insurance. I mean, it does help a lot, and it does create value on the estate side. Okay, so in my view, again, do we need insurance on the succession side? No. Because in my view, that operating bubble, I'll use a corporation as an example, belongs to the business and is not part of your personal net worth. So having said that, we now move over to the estate planning side. And you're saying, okay, I own seven quarters of land at Didsbury. I want to leave, some, I want to leave most of this land over to my business, which, is, which, which happens to be my partner with my son. But I want to leave some land uh, to our farm children. But I should leave quite a bit more to them if I want to be somehow equitable or fair. I, I, I don't use the word equal ever, but fair in our view of what fair means to our family. So life insurance is always that liquidity that allows you to leave life insurance proceeds to a non-farm child in order to transfer more assets from your personal wealth over to the operating side. The company can pay the premiums. I don't care about that because the insurance can still be left to a, to a beneficiary who's a non-farm uh, child. But I did mention in Red Deer that day, and here's something I want to bring up. I don't understand when we're trying to create increased value in a parent's uh, estate side, insurance is a, a component of that, why is it always the business's responsibility to do that? And I use this example in Red Deer. Sometimes we have to look at this and say, you know, if the, if the estate planning side pot isn't big enough, maybe the off-farm children should actually put money into the insurance policy as an investment. I know it's, it's radical, but why not? And uh, I can go through a long example of that, but it doesn't matter who owns the policy. Different people can make the uh, actual payment of those policies, and if we want to have a million-dollar life insurance policy, maybe the farm should pick up half, maybe the uh, parents should pick up a quarter, if that's what we want to do, 
maybe the off-farm children who are the inheritors of that policy should pay a quarter of the premium. I know it doesn't sound, it's not very, it's never promoted that way, but I think we have to look at that more and more. Okay, we have a, this might be more of a comment than a question from Bernadette. Mark, the word of enticing the new generation to become far part, to become farm partners is truly a great concept through equity transfer. So Mark, you go ahead. Enticing the far, the farm young generation through equity transfer? That's how I read it. The word, of, the word of enticing the new generation to become farm partners is truly a great concept, dot, 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 through equity transfer. And again, that, that appears to be more of a comment than a question, so I'll move to Ron's question, which is, if you have land in your corporation, is it hard to take it out of the company? Uh, short answer, yes. <laughs> That's an issue I think it's really important to talk about. So whoever's asked that question, I want you to uh, uh, have a pencil there. There's a provision in the Income Tax Act. It's called Section 553A, and it allows you to take land out of your company and place it into other corporations. So what that means, I'll give you an example. If I have a, a client, let's say, who has uh, eight quarters of land in a corporation, and they decided they have two off-farm children, and their son is working with them over a number of years, and so the problem was, he said, well, because everything's in the company, I'm going to leave 20%, 10% each of the company shares to uh, Mr. X's sisters. And I met with his family and I said, no, I don't like that. If you know you're going to leave, and, and it's for two reasons. One, you'll have off-farm children owning shares in an active business owned by their brother. And I'll tell you, that doesn't work very well. And so what we decided to do was take a quarter out of the of the corporation, put it in uh, A Co, take another quarter out and put it in B Co. So effectively now we have three companies. Now before you guys all go crazy and say this is an accounting scheme, those two companies aren't active, they just simply hold land. Now in their estate planning now, those two companies can be left individually to the two daughters. So daughter one gets A Co, daughter B gets B Co. That land is now in their own companies. Carrying on, if down the road they wanted to sell that land to another person, because that company only owns land, there's a technical provision in the Act, they could actually use their exemption on the sale of those corporate shares and get the land to a third party. But I'd rather have the land put into separate companies. If some of that land is going down to the next generation who aren't actively in the business with you, rather than the, those people owning a percentage share of the active farm business that, that, that owns all the land. So yes, you can take land out of a company to another company, but you cannot take land out of a company to yourself personally without paying about 25% of the fair market value of that land in tax. Okay, that was the last question on the board, so I'll just wait a second here and see if anybody else adds any additional questions for either Merle or Mark. And it does not look like we're going to have any additional questions, so we're going to get ready to wrap things up here. So once again, thank you very much, Mark and Merle, for spending this time with us over the last three weeks. And I know you guys are scheming up some new additional ones to do in the future. Just want to quickly mention that if you subscribe to our newsletter off of our website, you can be sure to be included on the invitations uh, for future webinars, as well as on our website. You can watch the ones that Mark and Merle did the last couple of weeks and sign up for the one on March the 9th with Doug Moisey. And again, on behalf of the Alberta Canola Producers, thank you for spending some time with us this, us this morning. We hope you all have a great day, and hopefully Canada wins a gold for us tonight.